I'm going to start by reading uh, a small section of um, the book, and this is towards the end of the chapter that's about the wellness industry. And I just want everybody now reading this because it was Doreen's favorite section. So, Recall Emily, the young woman I mentioned earlier who resented being told that white people were responsible for slavery and said that after finding the white supremacist movement, quote, the guilt, I don't have it anymore, end quote. For Emily, getting involved in the white supremacist movement was a kind of escape hatch out of the dead end feelings she associated with being white. This seems to be one way to respond to circumstances when you have been raised white by people you love only to realize that your whiteness is part of a system that destroys people's lives. This realization can get so uncomfortable that people look for some kind of release to make it go away. Closely related to white guilt is shame. Self-help favorite Brene Brown has made a career for herself talking about shame, but she hasn't yet written about how we face the shame of whiteness. Basically, there are two types of shame. There is a good kind of shame, which I tend to think of as a healthy emotional reaction to learning about atrocities. If you learn about genocide, slavery, lynching, and police brutality, and you learn that the country you live in is founded on these practices, then feeling shame is an appropriate emotional response. However, if that good shame doesn't get metabolized, processed in some way, then it can become toxic shame. And toxic shame leads to all kinds of weird, awful behavior by nice white ladies, not least of which is white fragility. So how does one metabolize that kind of shame? It took a long time, but I eventually realized that it was shame that I felt when I couldn't stand to see my own reflection. After years of studying gender and plenty of therapy, I had figured out that part of the aversion I felt to seeing my own image was that I didn't have a thin ballet body, the tyranny of thinness again. But if I knew that, if I knew that my worth wasn't tied to my appearance, what, why did it still sting? More than just my disappointment at being a size 18 rather than a size two, what was painful for me was to realize that the size and shape of my body were a perennial disappointment to my mother, Shirley. I can still hear Shirley saying to my big granny about me, we'd so hope she'd be petite. For me, the thought of going to a pure bar class is a nightmare of potential humiliation. Even so, I understand why it might be seductive for someone, gendered femme, for whom having a ballet body is within reach. But it wasn't only the tyranny of thinness that made me hate seeing a picture of myself. In grappling with my family history of a sadistic grandmother, maternal, and a clan and pedophile granddaddy, paternal, I've had to come to terms with the guilt and shame of that. The awareness that my ancestors helped to construct white supremacy and work to keep it in place so that it could benefit me is a bitter reality. And it is no comfort to try to wall off those facts from my consciousness or dismiss them with platitudes about a different era. My feelings, I imagine, are similar to Emily's who was disturbed to learn that white people, her ancestors, were responsible for slavery and who found comfort in the arms of unapologetic white supremacists. Probably because I had more resources than Emily, like lots of education and radical lesbians who helped me reimagine kinship, I chose another way. For me, I found that metabolizing the shame of whiteness is work to be done on your own, in therapy, in work, in workshops and groups with other white people who get this, and in community with other people who are engaged in dismantling the damage white supremacy has done and continues to do. Usually, this is not the kind of thing on offer from the wellness industry or from those advertising self-care, but maybe it should be. What if self-care for white women looked like processing guilt and learning to metabolize the shame of white supremacy? What if instead of figuring out how to make moon juice at home, we tried to create a more equitable social world and become what author Layla Said calls a good ancestor? 
Without connection, care, and community, self-care is packaged and sold to us in ways that wall us off from our individual responsibility for the damage that racist systems cause. Wellness without a radical collective politics doesn't offer resistance to regimes of power, but rather a way to remain in them. The shallow promise of the wellness industry from Goop to clean eating, to pure bar, to hashtag radical self-care influencers, is that it tries to sell us tinctures, potions, and vaginal steams to help us accept the lonely mediocrity of being a nice white lady. And I'll stop there. So, Irene, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And I, I didn't, I had my mute off. I, I was on mute just because I didn't know what was happening in the rest of the house. <laughs> But now that everyone's gone, I can embrace. I'm so happy to be here. I do love that passage because I think it sums up so much of what is happening in this book, what's happening with people um, right now. And, and before we go into that a little bit, what I want to do, because there's people here who are very well versed in this material, and there are people here that are not and uh, want but want to learn and so mm -hmm. i just want you if you could set the scene a little bit or just just de define some terms that people may not understand sure. particularly which are whiteness and what is a white nice lady yeah so i use these terms both whiteness and nice white lady i use them a lot throughout the book and so um i'll start with whiteness because it's kind of um one of the places i start in the book um you know I've been studying whiteness for a long time, and it's this funny term that makes, I think, a lot of people uncomfortable. One of the things that we know about whiteness is that the boundaries of it change. They're constantly changing, like who gets to count as white and who doesn't. Um, certainly in the United States, we have this long history of self-identification uh, with race, and people can can sort of be the race that they declare themselves. And increasingly, we know that more and more people who um, at another time period might not have been considered white are declaring themselves white. So there's a, a big piece in the New York Times about the latest census and all the people who at another point in time might have been called Spanish surname or Hispanic or Latino, now Latinx. And a lot of those folks are, are choosing whiteness. So it's a, it's a category that um, changes, the boundaries of it change. But the thing that we know is that once that category attaches to people's identity, all sorts of stuff flows to them. There's a there's an old um, Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live skit where he, you know, basically gets everything everything free because he's uh, playing a white man, and it, it kind of works like that actually. Um, nice white ladies. Um, you know, all of us who are raised white and gendered femme may at some point be considered nice white ladies. I myself, when I walk into a room, no one knows that I've been studying this, trying to divest my, uh, myself from whiteness for a long time. They just assume that I'm a nice white lady like any others. The, the point really of the book and a, the point of sort of singling out nice white ladies is that, you know, we, we skate. <laughs> and by that, I mean, we get away with a lot of stuff um, that we, we we shouldn't you know there are, there are ways in which this identity of being a nice white lady causes harm in society and i think you know there have been lots of examples recently you know the whole idea of the karen meme and particularly the one i make a lot out of in the book is the the woman that became known as central park karen who's who's um who yeah. called the police yeah who who yeah. called the police on a uh, African-American gentleman who was birding, he actually just asked her to follow the rules. And instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, let me leash my dog and follow the rules, she, you know, threw a hissy fit and um, called 911. Um, and so that's really the kind of damage that I'm talking about in society because nice white ladies are assumed to be, you know, beautiful and innocent and pure. Um, when we call authorities, we get um, all sorts of attention paid to our claims that other people don't when they call 911. And so one of the things, and it doesn't have to be something active in terms of causing damage, right? It doesn't have to be necessarily, and you outline the book how there are white women who call the police, as you were saying, on African Americans mm -hmm. who are, you know, eating or, or who are sitting in Starbucks or bird watching, right? Like Amy Cooper. Right. And then there's right. nice white ladies who work for the state, like Kristen or Kirsten Nielsen and right. or, or billionaires and financiers who actually 
actually fund white supremacy yeah. like Rebecca Mercer. Mercer so yeah. there are people that are do active things, right, in order to enhance and enforce, use their whiteness to enhance or enforce uh, white supremacy. But what I think what most people don't understand and want to learn more about is the people who just do nothing, right? Yeah. Who feel like they're they're benign, right? And they're right, just they're, right. and 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 I would love to talk about that and how that's harmful in relationship to you, right? You mm. said you were, you recall an incident, maybe you can talk about it, where mm -hmm. there was, you know, I think it was someone was, you know, berating and I think it was maybe an Asian American woman or let or um mm. and you said yeah, nothing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah when you could have used your whiteness if you will for good so can you yeah. talk a little bit about yeah. that and how harmful that could be and how, how harmful that is not just in your personal story but um for anyone else watching yeah yeah thanks for mentioning that story and i try i try to tell as many stories as i i can bear to tell about my own failures at this and that and that's one of them so i tell this story in the book about i was at a local library i was doing a writing day and you know the library makes the announcement the library is closing and and people start to go for the exits and you know as happens there are people standing in line for the bathroom and uh i don't know if she was asian or asian american woman walked into the bathroom ahead of me and the gentleman that was ahead of me and the gentleman ahead of me was an older i don't know maybe in his 70s or 80s older white man and you could tell he was irritated that she had gone in before him, even though she got there before he did. And then he starts to sort of grouse, you know, sort of complain about her being in the bathroom and taking too long. And then I could just feel it coming. And then his um, turn towards his racism uh, came out. He started saying racially uh, offensive things about her. And I really wanted to say something to him. Um, and I just didn't. And part of the reason I didn't is is really this niceness you know i was raised in in texas and there's a kind of texan and southern thing where you are just polite and you are nice to people you know no matter what and and i think that sort of kicked in but i think part of what we learn when we are raised to be nice white white ladies is that we learn to keep quiet that we learn to to make nice and we swallow a lot of vile um inequality when we do that and i i should have spoken up and i if I see him again, I will um, speak up next time. But but there's a way in which that discomfort at confronting people around their racism is is part of what leaves us in the situation that we're in. I mean, more than that, though, are a lot of people who um, who believe themselves to be racially innocent. I think that there are a lot of white women who think that race, the whole discussion about race has nothing to do with them. Um, there's another story, I don't think I tell this one in the book, but I was at a writer's workshop, which, you know, as, as you know, Doreen, because you've been to so many of these spaces, they can be a little dominated by white women, which is a subject for another discussion. But, um, but I was at one of these writer's workshops and there was a, a panel of white women who were leading a session on something to do with writing about trauma. And one of the few African-American women in the workshop raised her hand and said, yeah, I, I wanna um, have a conversation about writing about racial trauma. And I'll never forget one of the women on the panel just like physically moved her chair back and crossed her arms over her chest like this and said, well, I can't speak about that. I'm a white woman. <laughs> and in some ways, I, I think of that woman and that response is exactly who I'm writing this book for. It's like if you've ever folded your arms over your chest and said, I can't talk about race because I'm a white woman, I have a book for you. <laughs> Right. No, no, definitely. I mean, I think in, I, and I think there are people who do want to learn, but also, as you said, in what you just mentioned in terms of you at the bathroom and also in the story about Emily is that there's discomfort, right? There's this comfort of breaking out of the norm, which is niceness, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this discomfort feeling shame. Right. And so uh, of, of the, you know, of the, knowing that your ancestors and maybe even you have really upheld white supremacy um, and and have um, just denigrated people of color or people who are mm -hmm. who are not white. And mm -hmm. so 
how does someone work through that discomfort and what are some of the things i mean you you talk a little because that's you literally just have to go through it and we all know this when we're just you know we have you know, experienced discomfort over whatever so but can you talk a little bit about how one can do it and people you and you talk a little bit in the book about this like people who have overcome in order to be not just allies but accomplices mm -hmm. yeah i really think I, i'm going to start at the at the end of what you said and work backwards but i i really think that should be our goal that i i get kind of offended actually if somebody calls me an ally to the struggle for white supremacy like i can be an ally to trans people and I hope that i am uh but but that's not my struggle that i really believe that the struggle against white supremacy is my struggle because it's affected me so deeply and i think that part of what we have to do um to get to make that move from being you know just allies who are sort of standing by and watching what's happening cheering from the sidelines um to accomplices who are really trying to figure out how to kneecap white supremacy i think i think that requires a kind of um being able to sit with discomfort and i think that there are all kinds of things in american culture that <laughs> that want to distract us from any even second of discomfort that we have you know um so i think a lot of the self-care stuff the the sitting in white only yoga spaces is part of that retreat from dealing with some of the discomfort but i think that part of what has made this possible for me to do this work of sort of sitting with the discomfort of whiteness is that um i i came to whiteness i came to my individual whiteness fairly late in life. I mean, I tell the story in the book about my father who, you know, um, taught me about the Trail of Tears, the move, the forced move of Cherokee people from Georgia to Oklahoma, as if our family had been on it. He had a deep belief in his own Cherokee identity, he wasn't, um, and raised me with the same belief that I too was Cherokee. I am not. Um, but, but there was something about that um, that upbringing and sort of a distance that I had from whiteness, like my, my dad used to tell this joke, um, and w in which he would say, not me, Kimo Sabi, in which he he was the, the Tonto character, you know, he was the one who was distancing himself from whiteness. And so there was a way in which, almost by osmosis, I, I uh, had that same kind of distance from whiteness. It wasn't until I got, <laughs> I got to graduate school, which is pretty, you know, it was in my mid twenties when I got to graduate school and God bless Joe Fagan who handed me a copy of Custard Died for Your Sins. It's this great book by a scholar named Vine Deloria who's Native American himself. And he used to work at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and he would tell the story of every week there's some white person coming to his door who believes they have a Cherokee grandmother. And it was just, so when I read that, I just, you know, I just kind of was embarrassed, but I also thought, oh, I'm a cliche. This is not actually true, this belief I have. Um, what I am as a white woman, and and at the same time, I started reading um, uh, Ida B. Wells, right, and the red record of, you know, the history of lynching, which I didn't get in Texas public schools growing up, but I got that history, and I was like, oh, I'm the white woman that they're doing this horrible lynching for, and and how do I make sense of that? So this book is really kind of the process of me making sense of that, and trying to make sense of my own family, frankly. And their and their relationship to this. Yeah, so I, I would love to talk about that more because that's one of the things that I have questions about. And so I find it, one of the great things about this book is that not only is it really engrossing and extraordinarily researched, um, because you go into the history, to the present, to the future, etc. Um, and you talk about feminism and you talk about so many different layers of our society, both historically and currently. And so that is wonderful, but you also, there is a plane of memoir in here. There is, uh, you talk a lot about your family, yourself, your mother. And one of the things in relationship to what you were just talking about is that your father basically suggested told explicitly said you know what have you that you are cherokee right so much so that when your mother um when you when you were born like your mother cried and said that's not my baby because you were blonde and you did not look by any stretch of the imagination what she thought would be native yeah. and so i would love so so in this in the chapter love and theft you talk a lot mm -hmm. about um how white people 
both disavow, disparage, you know, people of color and other cultures and races, but at the same time, they appropriate it, they steal it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I would love to talk about this because this was also very new for, I mean, not the concept was not new, but right. I always knew, like, I know black people were always like, yeah, we got a little Cherokee or yeah, we got a little this, a little that, but I didn't realize that white people did it as well. So I'm curious about knowing that your grandfather was a member of the Ku Klux Klan and then your father really wanted to be Native American. Can you really talk about what that means, that juxtaposition? It seems to not make sense, but I'm, I know it does. And I, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's it, like, it kind of makes your head hurt at first, right? It's like, what? I, let me just take it back one more generation, just to the, the conversation about family. So the, my paternal great-grandfather is one of the people that, in our family, we called it made the run into Oklahoma. And basically what that means is that he was a homesteader. He got 160 acres from the federal government who was taking land away from indigenous people. Here you go. Here's 160 acres. Um, so from him to the clan granddaddy to my father, who was who claimed he was Native American. I mean, you know, just in three in the short span of three generations, going from stealing land from Indian people to believing oneself to be Indian. In some ways, it, I mean, it's hard to get your head around at first, but I, but I also think that it's so American. I mean, it's such a white American story in a particular way, because instead of, you know, taking responsibility and sort of trying to um, make amends for having stolen Indian land, instead, what we do is we appropriate the identity and say, oh, I'm, I'm really Indian. I feel it on the inside, you know, and attach it to some sort of spiritual quest. This was also my dad's story was that he felt spiritual when he was around Native American people. And it, it, so it kind of loops back around to the new age stuff, you know, that there's some way that we as white people imagine that we can escape um, our history, you know, that we can escape what we've done to create the society that we currently live in. And I think that we cannot, that we have to, that we have to face it, you know. Um, and I, so just sort of circling back a little bit to your question about the discomfort and how we deal with that. I mean, for me, just to connect the dots a little bit, the 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 silly and misbegotten belief that I was Cherokee gave me some distance from whiteness. So once I realized that I I was a nice white lady, it was uh, it was a little shocking, honestly. And and I didn't have the attachment to that identity. I didn't have an attachment to whiteness, so that when people started talking about whiteness in the world that I was in in graduate school, I didn't feel attacked you know i didn't i was talking about me i'm not, I'm not white oh right i guess i am but i think that that distance from whiteness gave me a little space to sort of um, you know deal with the issues and um yeah i, I think i'll stop there yeah no but no I, I definitely wait so i want to ask you one question so were yeah. you in like just a total follow-up question based on what you just said so were you like 16 17 like going to high school thinking you're native american identifying yourself as that with you know with blonde hair you know i'm just curious yeah so um the rest just the rest of that story is i um you know by the time i got to high school and i started applying to colleges my father this is the other part of that story my father who um was very um you know like imagine uh, what was his name um Ross Perot that ran for president, kind of imagine Ross Perot in your head. Um, and he was very anti-government held. But when I applied for college, he was like, well, check that box that says Native American. Maybe there's some money in it, you know, which is another aspect of the love and theft, right? Which is about pulling resources, right? From people who the resources are actually set up for. And then we see that a lot in these women accused of ethnic fraud. But by the time, you know, my dad is telling me to like check the Native American box by the time I'm going to college, I was kind of like, you know, I haven't actually met any other people that are Native American, so maybe this isn't true. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was in the mix of all the things as a teenager I was beginning to disagree with my parents on, and I kind of didn't have a place to put it. You know, it's just like, right. I mean, I think I probably still believed it, but not enough to check to actually check the box. So, um, and then, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, continue. And, and then um, when I was in graduate school, <laughs> Uh, I had a professor, I do tell the story in the, in the book, I had a professor who, when I was getting, I was deciding on a dissertation topic, I was really fascinated by the association of um, 
of club women, uh, the African American women who were in the club movement. I just I just could spend all day in an archive reading about that. Um, and a, a white woman professor advised me, well, if you're going to do that kind of work, you might want to grow your hair out and make it really dark so that people believe that you're Native American. <laughs> it's like, that's advice that you give people? Anyway, I didn't take that advice either. But um, but yeah, by the time I got to graduate school and I read Custer Died for Your Sins, I was just over it. But but isn't, I think we, we talk about in the book is that is whiteness, right? To be able to choose what resources, what benefits, who you want to be at what time, what you want to take advantage of, whether it's Absolutely. Rachel Dolezal, I don't, I never know how to pronounce her name. I hope I, you know, Good I don't know. Like, <laughs> why she has a new name now anyway. about her so much that I need to know, <laughs> but, you know, she was right. black when she was head of the NAACP, but when she was, I think, at Howard, she sued Howard because she thought she was being discriminated because she was As white. As a white person, yes. And then, um, yeah, and then your father, who wants you to check the box as Native American, but also when it was time to desegregate schools and you had to, you know, you would be forced to be bused, you know, mm -hmm. X amount of miles across town, he was like, absolutely not. And like sent, you, you know, you guys moved or to the, yeah. to the widest area of Houston yeah, yeah. to go to predominantly white schools, yeah. uh, a yeah. predominantly white school. So I think that's what, that's your point. Yeah. And part yeah. of the harm of whiteness is to be able to decide who you want to be at what time and, 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 and pulling resources from others in order to get whatever you want. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that there's a way in which white white women in particular have this sort of um it, it sort of gets emphasized in a way for white women because we're so unlikely to be suspected of any wrongdoing you know i mean there's this kind of way that uh, innocence attaches to white ladiness um that i think is really uh harmful in it and it it covers up all sorts of misdeeds um, and so that's also what I'm trying to pay attention to and, and call attention to is the way that that white women get away with stuff. And I, I think that time is coming to an end. You know, I mean, I think it's been part of the pushback, you know, the, of um, sort of videotaping white women calling 911. I think the pushback has been sort of an early warning notice that, you know, time is up on this game and we need to get smarter about who we are in society and what we're doing um, with the the structural position of whiteness that that gives us, you know, access to these resources. So are we going to keep hoarding those just for our our families? Or are we going to um, expand what I say, expand the circle of caring where we care about more than just our individual little families? And speaking of which, that's the next question. I have two more questions and then we'll open up for Q&A. Yeah. Um, so, so you do talk about the many different types of white, nice white ladies. And we've, I've talked about some of them you know, financiers, people who work for the state, um, you know, Car Carolyn Dunham, who, you know, accused Emmett Till um, and was the reason, you know, he was murdered um, and which she, re you know, later in her life, she talked about how she lied. Um, and there's just a different type of nice white ladies that cause harm. Mm -hmm. And what I was fascinated about, because I am a mother and I write so much about motherhood, is, is your section on mothers and how, you know, white mothers, um, you know, motherhood is, is basically is a concept that is, you know, deemed white, right? Mm -hmm. And so you talk about how you, the purity of it, the nurturing aspect, mm -hmm. how, you know, they can do no wrong. Um, and you talk about Princess Diana, who was not, who was, who was a mother, obviously, of her children, but also of the world. And she, yeah. you know, she worked with children. all, And so it was seen in that begets, you know, Madonna and Angela Jolie Jol 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 and all these different right. people who did the same thing. But they were also the same people, these mothers were also, who were huge anti- desegregationists. I mean, you see the pictures of where they're screaming and yelling. Um, you know, they're the same mothers who like Felicity Hoffman, who tried to get their children into yeah, school exactly. when they have the wealth to do so um, on the, on, at, through the back door rather than the yeah, front. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also you talk about how mothers are the ones that because they generally or traditionally or typically or however you see it, raise the children they pass on the mores and the culture um and the whiteness um from generation to generation so my question to you um do you think that nice white mothers are the worst kind of or more dangerous <laughs> let's say 
kind of nice white lady? Well, I, I don't know about ranking. I mean, I don't know who I'd call the worst, really. There's so many bad ones to choose from. Um, but I think that there is a way talking about sort of damage that we do that we that we don't think about. I think that passing on whiteness is one of those things that um, that white mothers have not, we're way before the beginning of even talking about this, you know? So one of the stories that I tell, and again, I, I try to bring in my own life, but one of the stories I tell in this book is, um, is a phrase that my mother used when I was growing up. Now, my mother um, was born in 1934, and she grew up in central Texas on a, on a farm, just what we call a dirt farm. I'm sure they tried to grow other things besides dirt, but, um, and she grew up really poor, and I was born in um, 61, and so I grew up right uh, during the civil rights movement, right, when all that was going on. And I just say that to lay some context, but um, a phrase that my mother used that I hadn't thought about in, I don't know, 35, 40 years, was um, you would bitch if you were hung with a new rope, wouldn't you? <laughs> it just, it came to me in a dream one time. Uh, I was, whatever, it doesn't matter the dream, but um, I, that phrase just came back to me and I was like, what is that about? And I was actually in the process of writing this book when that dream happened and I thought of that phrase. And, and as I was going through it, it was like, I, <laughs> I wrote a master's thesis on lynching. And why did I not ever think about that phrase? Because that's that's a phrase that says we are the people of the rope. We will we will end your life if you don't behave according to the so, social norms and mores in, in our uh, society. And and I thought about that as kind of an, an instance, a sort of example of passing on whiteness that my mother had done for me, you know, like this is how you're supposed to be. She did it in, in lots of other ways too, like her expectation for me, like the whole reason, I don't think I talk about this in the book, but the whole reason that I was forced to take tennis lessons at noon in the summer in Corpus Christi, Texas, which by the way, is very hot. It's like above 95 every day. Um, but part of the reason that she wanted me to, to learn how to play tennis is because she imagined that I would uh, marry well, by which she meant marry a rich white man and be part of the country club set, you know, and have a woman of color who would clean for me while I was playing tennis, right? That was her vision. And in, in part, I mean, it's a very gendered vision. And we have all this writing about gender and and sort of how gender is implicated in that, but um, we don't have much writing about how whiteness is implicated in that. And I'm, that's sort of where I'm trying to push the conversation. It's like, what about that upbringing was really about passing on whiteness? Um, and one of the, the other stories in the book, you know, is about um, white women who have adopted children from other countries. And there's a a woman in the book who um, I don't name, but she um, was a one of these mom influencers on YouTube, and she made a big deal of adopting this kid from um, a child from China who had some learning difficulties that he may have been autistic. Um, and I want you to know they sent that child back like a defective appliance, you know, because in some ways, part of what I'm arguing is that they couldn't pass on whiteness to this child who was so different than they were. Um, so, so I think there are ways in which the passing on of whiteness is, is a conversation that we who are raised to be white women who become white mothers have to start grappling with. What does it mean when we, um, I mean, we've done a pretty good job actually of talking about gender and the ways that we pass on gender. Of course, we haven't stopped it or disrupted it yet certainly not dismantled it, but at least we're cognizant of it. And there are some people who are, you know, beginning to talk about how do we raise children without gender, right? I think we've got to start having a conversation about how do you raise kids and not pass on whiteness to them, or at least their individual belief in their own whiteness and their own white superiority. There are so many questions that I want to ask you, especially I do want to talk a little bit about your mother, but we don't have much time. And there's yeah. one question I think is very important. We have another question from the audience. You say at the very beginning that you want this book to call in white women mm -hmm. rather than call out white women. Mm -hmm. Can you, and, and I feel like this is you coming from a place of care and community when you say that. So can you talk yeah. about what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I really, it's a, it's kind of an easy thing these days to, to dunk on white women. I mean, 
<laughs> there is no shortage of bad behavior that has been uh, on offer, you know, and some of it's kind of silly and funny and some of it's deadly serious and people die at the end of it. Um, so I, so I don't see much value actually, um, either culturally or socially in calling out people and just sort of naming their bad behavior. To me, calling in not only comes from a place of care, but it actually comes from a place of my uh, spiritual tradition, which, you know, which believes that people um, can have redemption moments and can experience transformation. And, and I think that, you know, um, one of my favorite descriptions of this book actually is a, uh, an early reader who called it a gentle double dare. And that's kind of how I think of the book. You know, I think of it as here's what I've done. You know, I've, I've grappled with my own whiteness, my own white, nice white ladyhood. Um, and here's what I've come up with sort of in the book. And now what are you going to do? And so that's the calling in to me is like, okay, I've done this work. Now, what are you going to do with your life? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to a, a question here. Um, how do you begin approaching whiteness within your family or do you? And this person is from the Midwest and she presumably she struggles with using her privilege of education to educate her very white family who see themselves as neutral and benign and not racist. Yeah. Yeah, it's a super complicated question, right? Of families and, and how we talk to them about race. Um, I, I, in the conclusion of the book, I talk about eight things that people can do. And, and one of them is I have a real, um, I, have a, I, I think a thoughtful way of approaching it, which is I don't know that individuals talking to their own families about whiteness and white supremacy is always the best thing to do. And here's a couple of reasons why. One of them is, you know, families have all these dynamics around them about, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, who got the most love? You know, if if you're all if you're still caught up in, well, mom loved you more, interjecting race into that conversation could go horribly awry. And I don't necessarily recommend it. Sort of more seriously, if you've got somebody in your family who um, you know, has weapons. I don't think you want to start raising issues about race with those family members. I just don't, I think it's a safety thing. And then the other thing is I would encourage the person who asked the question to think about your own, um, your own needs and sort of what you're doing for yourself when you're raising this with your family. I know for my, um, my own stuff, my own family I'm, and with my father in particular, it was, it was a way of having a fight about other things that were going on um, in our family. And, and I think that I certainly used uh, race as a way to, to get back at him for certain things. And that's, you know, that's not uh, leading to liberation for any of us. That's not helping. Um, so I'm not sure that families are always the best place to start, even though um, uh, that's often what we're encouraged to do is to start with our families. But there's a lot going on in families. <laughs> that is true. Okay. Um, someone wrote, um, thank you for being so vulnerable um, in applying this concept to yourself. Uh, and what this person says, what you're describing as race or whiteness is inextricably intertwined with economic privilege. Sure. Well, first, okay. Um, well, I'm curious as to whether you agree <laughs> with that or not, but it's not my question. Um, therefore, to what degree could rich women of color also possess and thus exhibit some forms of privilege and thus whiteness? Yeah, um, sure. There are ways in which um, economic advantage is baked into whiteness, but I, the kinds of things that I'm trying to tease out are things that are not specifically about class, so they wouldn't apply to women of color who have a certain uh, class privilege. Um, so it's not, um, I, and I think that what's underneath that question is kind of something about, I, I could be wrong, but is something about how uh, you know, class is more important than race in some ways, or that gender is more important than race. And, and part of what I'm trying to do is offer an intersectional analysis that really takes intersectionality, including class, race, and gender, all those things at one time, seriously, when we turn our lens to white women who generally don't get that kind of uh, examination or study. 
Okay, and we're at the uh, end of our time. I don't know if Serena is going to come back on or not. Um, but I just is. want to say very quickly, I um, and it's always nice to be in conversation with you, Jesse. It's so wonderful to be in conversation with you, Doreen. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank of you. Course. Thank you. Congratulations on your book birthday. Um, you. Yeah, this was wonderful. My, I would hold up my uh, copy, but I don't even know where the <laughs> cover is. It was like I drove it so much the wheels fell off. I have no idea where the cover is. Full stack. Thank you. <laughs> Thank well, you.